in this video, we'll be discussing the philosophy of Hinduism, including an interesting metaphysical system, which it includes, as well as an important ethical concept, which is cross-cultural. In fact, there is no such thing as Hinduism. Hinduism is a label which refers to the variety of indigenous religions in India. Hindu and Hinduism get their name from the Indus River Valley Civilization and the Indus River And this culture likely used a language originally which linguists have labeled Proto-Indo-European, which serves as a basis for Sanskrit as well as Greek, Latin, Russian, and through Greek and Latin, English. Most people aren't aware that Sanskrit and Hindi, the dialects and languages which develop from Sanskrit, have a relationship to contemporary English. But in fact, that's precisely what we'll discover as we go on. Hinduism is also polytheistic. Once we leave Hinduism, we'll be focusing more on monotheistic religions. There are more gods in Hinduism than we have time to go through, and the individual deities are not what's of primary interest for us philosophically. We see in this religion also an idea of the immortal soul, so that is a cross-cultural theme as well. And in Hinduism, the transmigration, or movement of the soul after death, is accomplished through reincarnation. As we saw previously in Shintoism, and we'll see again later in Buddhism, for example. What we'll spend just a moment discussing is what's called Advaita Vedanta. Advaita Vedanta. means non-divided study of the Vedas. The Vedas are the ancient sacred religious texts of Hinduism. And there are two ways of understanding the metaphysic or belief system about the ultimate nature of reality those sacred texts provide. The much more common understanding of the relationship between the gods and the world is called dualistic, coming from a word meaning two. Dualistic, in this context, refers to a separation or division between gods and the world. We have this same dualistic metaphysical system in Christianity very often as well, although not exclusively as we'll see later.
In Christianity, dualism means that God is separate from the world, that we have creator and creation. We also have good and evil as two opposite extreme poles. That would be a dualism as well. And finally, a dualism between the supernatural realm of heaven and hell and the physical realm of earth and the universe. The opposite of this understanding would suggest or posit that there is no separation between the supernatural and the natural or between gods and us. Advaita Vedanta is a Hindu philosophical system that argues that there is no division between the divine realm and our realm. Thus, this world is heaven and or hell. And the gods are not up above separate and distinct. Instead, we are the gods and the gods are us, as well as everything else. The word a divaita has two parts, a meaning not, and divaita, meaning divided. You may notice a similarity in the sound between the words divaita and divided. The reason for that similarity is because of the shared etymological root through Proto-Indo-European to both Sanskrit and Hindi and Greek, Latin, and English. And there are other examples besides those, though we won't identify them here. So, Advaita Vedanta can specifically be called a monistic philosophical system. Monism simply refers to a philosophical system with only one part. This is important because we will see many other forms of monism throughout the semester. Pay special attention to them because they're subtle, interesting. Each time they occur quite unique and always philosophically relevant. Take the time to learn to distinguish between monism, a philosophical system with only one part, and dualism, a philosophical system with two parts we will see a number of both of them 
throughout the semester. So pay attention and keep track of them as we go. In addition to the monistic metaphysic offered by Advaita Vedanta, in which there is no division between the divine and the natural, the gods and us. Hinduism also relatively uniquely offers us an early version of a virtue ethic or moral virtue based on nonviolence. In Hinduism, the term for this is ahimsa, where ah means not and himsa means harm or violence. For Hinduism, and a religion which develops from it called Jainism, the core and foundation of all ethical behavior is simplistically found in nonviolence. What we'll see as we progress through this semester is that in the various cultures of the world there are various fundamental foundations for ethics whereas in Hinduism Buddhism and particularly the ancient Greek philosophy of Socrates and Plato. Nonviolence is at the center of what makes someone ethical, moral, or virtuous. For some other cultures, being a person of faith or belief is what makes primarily someone ethical where violence often can be justified or perhaps is of lesser importance than the proper faith pay special attention as we continue forward about the difference between what the foundation of ethics is in various cultures. Nonviolence, faith, or something else perhaps. For Jainism, Nonviolence is taken practically to an extreme. Jains traditionally will not eat any animal products. They are completely vegetarian or vegan. Traditionally, Jains will wear something like a surgical mask over their mouths for practically their entire lives whenever possible so that they don't accidentally swallow a gnat killing it and harming it this is a religion that literally would not harm a fly Jains traditionally will not take any form of transportation other than their own two feet. So they don't splatter bugs on windshields or anything else. And as they walk, 
where they need to go. Traditionally, Janes will carry with them a simple wicker broom to gently nudge aside any beetles or ants that may lay in their path that they wouldn't want to step on. For Jainism, nonviolence is the single most important ethical principle in the entirety of life. Let's deal briefly with the laws of Manu and an interesting text called the Satapata Brahmana. In the laws of Manu, we see an explanation of what are called the law of karma, which really is quite similar to what you might have heard in your daily life. It's a sort of spiritual principle that what goes around comes around. Or that good actions create good things, bad actions bring about more bad things. In the Santapata Brahmana, we see a story similar to the story of Noah in the book of Genesis, where the gods tell Manu to build a boat, to take all varieties of animals onto that boat, to save them from a great flood. Manu, in this story, serves a similar purpose or similar role to not only Noah, because he is the survivor of a great flood, but also Moses, because Manu is a lawgiver, as well as Adam and Eve because according to Hindu religion all people are descended from Manu. Thus all people have a divine ancestry because Manu gains a wife who originally forms out of a sacrificial offering of butter he had left for the gods after surviving the flood. Therefore, because of that miraculous transformation, Manu's wife is divine. And so, too, all people descended from her, which is everyone. This, too, might help us understand the monism we had seen previously in Advaita Vedanta. In this artistic representation, you see Manu with his family in a very small boat. You don't see the animals in this depiction. Drowned under the waves is a demon. And Manu has tied his boat to the horn of a great fish. 
I know it looks like this fish is eating this character coming out of his mouth. But in fact, the fish is the lower half of this character's body. The upper half is the human form of the god Vishnu. This is Vishnu's incarnation as Matsya, the great fish. In much the same way that Jesus comes down and assumes a physical form on earth, in Hinduism the god Vishnu comes down a number of times in various forms. Everything from a fish and a turtle to a dwarf and a human. When he's needed to do whatever he needs to do on earth. And this story is one of those incarnations. Hinduism has an incredible depth philosophically, ethically, and socioculturally with a wide range and diversity of issues, paradoxes, contradictions, as well as beauty, majesty, and wonder, which makes it one of the world's great religions. Sometimes we refer to the world's religions as wisdom traditions, because they are repositories of beauty, of myth and metaphor, symbolism, as well as a variety of approaches to understand how we should live our lives. One of the things I often ask my classes in the context of multiculturalism is if Hinduism were to go extinct, were to be replaced by Christianity and Islam, for example, would the world have lost anything of value? Is diversity of belief systems in intrinsically valuable? Or is Hinduism, like all non-Christian religions, inherently inspired by the devil and thus a false religion meant to lead people away from the true faith, the one true faith, whatever that may be. In our next video, we'll be turning to the first of our monotheistic philosophical systems to deal with, Judaism, and deal with it in specific detail because of its unparalleled relevance to the Western world, its culture and cultures, the philosophy and philosophies that develop within and from it, as well as in response to it, and because it forms the foundation for Christianity as well as Islam the two biggest religions on planet Earth today, and certainly religions of relevance for understanding what's going on in the modern world. If we are to understand the big movements which shape history and our contemporary era, 
we must understand their origins. For that, we'll investigate Judaism.